Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author, Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. It's a beautiful day today. The sun is shining. We're in Megiddo, which is called the Tale of Megiddo, where Solomon built a chariot center. Actually, it goes back to the time of King Ahab. It is best known for the battle of all battles at the time of the end called the Battle of Armageddon. Now, normally, when I'm standing here, I will do a prophetic message. Today, we're going to switch it out. Now, I have a cameraman with me. Come on over here, Robbie. Robbie's taking pictures probably right now, so he's just going to come over here. Robbie's, Robbie was baptized in the Holy Spirit in my meeting. His father was converted to the Lord in one of my meetings when I preached a message called, I don't want to be a Christian. Right. And I gave every excuse why people do, do not want to be a Christian. And his dad had used every one of those excuses. Well, his dad got saved and has won many people to the Lord. How many times have you heard me preach? Around a thousand times, probably. A thousand times. This message that I'm about to share is rated, in your opinion, how? In the top 10 of all times. Uh, uh, top 10 of all times. Yes. You're about to hear something that changed my life. And I'm telling you, it's a story. But when I heard this, it has changed the way I talk. It has changed the way I think. It has changed the way that I look at how God can do things. We call it a message from an angel in a whirlwind. In the book of Ezekiel, some of you know this, and I've been talking about this recently, we have been doing a study Bible, and it'll be ready probably in a couple years, hopefully. I have been in the book of Ezekiel, and in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel talks about a whirlwind, and he's down uh, in Chaldea, and he sees a whirlwind coming out of the north. Now, if you've never heard us do a teaching on this, in Isaiah 14, Satan says he will ascend to heaven in the sides of the north. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the third heaven is where paradise is located. The first level of heaven are the clouds. The second level are the stars. The third level of heaven is where paradise is located, where the saints go when they die, where they wait until the resurrection of the dead. In Psalms, it mentions, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king? Ezekiel sees a whirlwind enfolding itself. Now, I feel like I'm going to have to just uh, take a little bit of time right here and explain something from Ezekiel that's fascinating. <clears throat> In that vision, Ezekiel chapter 1, he sees cherubim and they are carrying a throne. He describes this throne in chapter 1 as a sapphire stone. Now, God's throne is not a throne that is embedded with sapphires. I want you to hear this. This is in your Bible. God's throne is an entire sapphire stone. That's in Ezekiel 1. And he's cut it out somewhere to make a seat out of it. Now, sapphire is very interesting because sapphire is formed in heat. In fact, sapphires actually come out of volcanic rock. When Satan in Ezekiel is described as the anointed cherub that covereth, God said he had walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. That had a reference to when God created the earth. Now we're getting on a rabbit trail here. That's all right. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in verse 2, the earth is without form and void, and darkness is upon the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God's moving upon the face of the water. In Hebrew, when it says God created, rabbis have noted that that Hebrew word for created implies complete. But in verse 2, everything's in chaos. In verse 2, the earth is being cooled down with water. May I suggest something to you? that in the beginning in Genesis 1-1, when God created the original heaven and earth in the ages past, may I suggest to you that Lucifer was not yet a fallen angel because the book of Job says, where were you, Job? When I laid out the foundation of the earth, when I stretched out the cornerstone thereof, where the sons of God sang together and the morning stars shouted for joy. 
angels were present at creation, which is Genesis 1-1. In Genesis 1-2, why is the earth without form and void? Why is darkness upon the face of the deep? You ready for this? Matthew's gospel said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Satan fell between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And what happened is at the fall, God comes to the earth Hell is always beneath, hell is always below. And God creates the chambers under the earth. You have Sheol, these are the biblical words that are used in the original language. You have Hades, you have Tartarus, which is in 2 Peter, the angels that kept not their first estate, he's bound in Tartarus. Um, in Greek thinking, that is the lowest compartment in the bowels of the earth where the most wicked spirits go. You have Gehenna, which is a New Testament Greek word used for hell throughout the four Gospels. Now, let's go back to this original thought. God's throne being sapphire. I have on my board of directors a man named Wayne Penn. Among other things that Wayne does, Wayne is a laser scientist. Many years ago, we were in a discussion of something I heard when I went to Israel. I heard that there was a tradition that goes back all the way to the time of Moses that was handed down to Joshua the elders and the elders told it to their children and their children's children that the original Ten Commandments were actually written on a sapphire stone. Wayne looked at me and he said, theoretically, it's totally possible. And I said, how could it be theoretically be totally possible? He said, because in the book of Exodus, God wrote with the fiery finger of his hand. God's fire, because, well my, in the book of Ezekiel 1, it says that the person on the throne is fire from the loins up and fire from the loins down. Our God is a consuming fire. And when God took his finger, it was the original laser. He said, aluminum oxide is in most rocks on earth, but especially in parts of the Middle East, like the Sinai Desert, there's heavy aluminum oxide. And I said, what does that have to do with the Ten Commandments? He said, because you have to heat aluminum oxide to make a sapphire. And when God came down in the book of Exodus and walked with the elders on top of the mountain, and 70 of them, in your Bible it says, ate with God on the mountain. Do you know what it says in Exodus? Underneath his feet was a pavement of sapphire stone. So everywhere God shows up with his presence and fire, sapphires start showing up. I hope somebody's hearing what I'm saying. Now that's not the message, by the way. That has nothing to do with the message other than I just want to talk about sapphire stone. I just felt like it would be a good thing. What I really want to talk about for a moment is I want to talk about the idea of how angels manifest in whirlwinds and how God manifests in a whirlwind. Uh, this will come up on the screen. In Genesis 3 and 8, there was a wind in the cool of the day in the garden that God met with man. Exodus chapter 14 and 21, the wind opened up the Red Sea. Numbers 11, 31, God uh, through, used wind to bring quail, uh, dropping them in the wilderness for the children of Israel. Psalms chapter 18, verse 10, God rode upon a cherub and did fly. Wish I had time to preach that. And was seen upon the wings of the wind. Ezekiel 1 and 4, when the wind appeared, it appeared in a whirlwind in the book of Exodus 1, and God was in the middle of the whirlwind. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. Now, the reason I've taken you through the idea of the wind is a story that was related to me by Pastor Robert Kimberling, who has a relative here on our tour, by the way. Robert Kimberling pastors at the East Point Church of God in East Point, Florida. I was with him in the month of May of 2011. And in the month of May in 2011, he related to me one of the most fabulous stories I've ever heard in my life. And as I said earlier, I'm about to give you a revelation on Manifest. And for those of you that have never heard this, that absolutely can change your life. Rob, Brother Kimberling and his wife were called upon in 1985 to go to South Dakota to pastor a church. It happened to be uh, connected with the Church of God denomination. When he got there, uh, it was a very historic church, by the way. A lot of great men of God came out of that church over history. But when he got there, he was uh, approached by the clerk. Her name was Valley Bishop. And the clerk said, Brother Kimberling, it's very important. You have a charter member of this church. She's about 80 years of age. She lives 40 miles from here in Bison, South Dakota. She's already called and said, you must come and see her on the weekend and visit her. Well, Brother Kimberling said, my wife and I decided that we would take the trip down there. We were very busy. We were a new pastor there. Didn't have a lot of time, you know, to spend hours talking to someone. So he said, we drive all the way down there on a Saturday. 
So when we get down there and she, she opens the door, it's a lady by the name of Liz Brockwell. Now, Liz has been a charter member of this church, remember, from way back. She's 80 years of age. So Brother Kimberly introduces himself. He says, now, Sister Brockwell, we won't be here long. And she says, that's what you think. Get in here. It's like a good grandma, isn't it? And so she brings him in and she said, I've already prepared lunch and I've, I've brought you here to tell you the story of my testimony that's one of the most remarkable things I think you'll ever hear. And he said when it was over, it was. The story goes something like this. It was the year of 1929, right before the Great Depression. In that part of the country, in South Dakota, there was the Dust Bowl that was taking place. Some of you will remember reading in history that at the beginning of the Great Depression in the Midwest, that the winds were blowing and they were blowing in dirt and when they would try to plant something, the dirt would just overtake it and overpower it and nothing was growing. Sister Brockwell was married to a man named Adam. Adam was her husband. They had two daughters. They were attempting to raise their daughters during a very critical time when this dust bowl was coming in, when they were losing. Uh, in fact, they were afraid of losing their farm at that particular time. Now, if that's not bad enough, her husband, Adam, came down with tuberculosis. And they sent him to a sanitarium in Rapid City, South Dakota. Now, if that's not bad enough, she gets a call one day from the doctor at the sanitarium. And the doctor says, Miss Brockwell, does your husband have a suit, like a black, a dark suit? <clears throat> she said, yes, he does. He said, all right, I want you to bring it to the sanitarium next time you come because it'll be the last time you'll see him alive. Now, here's a mama with two daughters with going through what's about to be the Great Depression, having the dust bowl, the dust just tear their farm up, trying to save the farm when they don't have any income. And what made it worse is the cow had been injured. They had one cow, and the cow had cut itself on a fence, and there were maggots. It was laying down. It couldn't even stand up. It was so weak, and there were maggots. Now, anybody that's ever been raised on a farm knows if your animal gets cut to the point of maggots, it's, you might as well say it's dead. So Sister Brockwell is praying, and she's interceding, and she says to God, God, you've got to help me. I'm a faithful tither. I support the church. I have prayed all my life since I was a young girl. Please help me. Intervene on my behalf. So she goes outside. And she goes outside that day to check on the cow, and she's feeding the cow some grain and some water with her hand, trying to give it at least a little bit of nourishment to keep it alive a little longer. All of a sudden, a dust devil shows up. How many of you know what a dust devil is? We all do. It's that little tornado-looking wind, and it was real thick, but it was coming from one area. And she just stopped and looked at it, and it was headed straight toward her. And she says, well, that's all I need is a dust devil to show up to my house, you know. <laughs> all of a sudden, Pastor Kimberling said, when the dust devil got near her, the dust fell, and a man was standing in front of her. Now, that's not a normal man. It was an angel of God in the form of a man. I don't think that can't happen because the Bible said we entertain angels unaware. Now, when the man came to her, the man came to her with a message from the Lord. Here's what this angel of the Lord said. The angel of the Lord said, Adam will not die. He will return home, and you will father another child, and he will live. He will live long enough to see that child raised. As a sign to you from God, today your cow will stand up and walk to the barn on its own and be healed. She got so excited, here's what she said. She said, if this happens, oh, y'all get ready for this now. Robbie's about to shout on the camera. She said to this man that was the angel of God, if this happens, I will take that cow once God heals it, and I will sell it for world missions. That is when the man pointed his finger to her and called her by her name and said seven words that were this. Ready? There are no ifs in God's plan. The man who was the angel disappeared. She goes back in the house. She's all excited. She'd already got the suit out, but she decided not to take it to the sanitarium. Then her brother shows up with the shotgun to kill the cow. As she goes outside to tell him not to kill the cow because God's going to heal the cow, the cow stands up and walks to the barn with the maggots falling out. The cow gets healed. So she goes down to the sanitarium to make a visit at the sanitarium. And as she goes down to the sanitarium to make the visit at the sanitarium, she walks in without the suit. And as she walks in without the suit, the doctor says to her, where's the suit? I told you to bring a suit. She says, doctor, don't worry about it. My husband's going to be healed. Yeah. He's coming out of this place and God's going to heal him. And the doctor got so angry at her 
He didn't believe it. He thought she was just emotionally over-religious. But guess what happened? Two weeks later, he was healed and they dismissed him from the sanitarium. Oh, guess what happened? He, he fathered another daughter. Oh, guess what happened? He not only got to see the, that daughter raised, but he outlived the doctor that told him he was going to die. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! Now, let me tell you something for a moment. Here's the message that changed my life. There are no ifs in God's plan. Do you know how many times you say the word if? Let me just say something to you. If is used three different ways in the Bible. 1,541 times it is found. It's called a conjunction in the English language, and it joins word and statements together. I looked up in an English dictionary or an English concordance the definition of if, and here's what it said. The definition of if depends on how it's used. It can be used in the event of granting that or in the condition of. Now, I don't know how many times that you have said if. You know, if God will only help me, or if God will only heal me, or if God would only supply my need, or if God would only give me a job. But you have to understand, there are no ifs in God's plan. And what I want to say to the TV audience today is, you've got to take the if out. When someone came to Jesus, first of all, let me talk about the three ifs. There's no ifs in God's plan, but because we have a covenant with God, our covenants are based on conditions. And so there is an if of God that's based on not God working for us, not God's will for us, but upon the condition. Here's what God said. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. It, ooh, if you, Lord, 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 if you keep my commandments and abide in my love, even as I've kept my father's commandment and I abide in his love. So the if of God is always based on a condition that you be obedient to him. Number two, there's what I call the if of man. The if of man is always a question. When they came to Jesus, a leper said, if you will make me whole. What did Jesus do? He took the if out. He said, I will be made whole. On another occasion, there was, a, there was a man that came to Jesus and wanted to know, will you heal my son? Your disciples tried but failed. But if you can do anything, have compassion on me. Jesus said, no, if you can believe. All things are possible to them that believe. And here's what I want to show you because this is very important. I want you to hear this, okay? The if of man is always connected to the will of God trying to make you doubt the will of God. The if makes a person doubt the willingness of God to perform his word in your life. So in other words, when you put an if in front of your prayer, what you're saying is, God, I really don't know if you can do this. I really don't know if this is going to happen. And then there's the if of Satan. The if of Satan, you, you know it's the devil when it always is, is making you doubt. In, in Matthew 3, 4, 3 and 4, 6, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. If you be the son of God, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. Look, gee, Satan knew who Jesus was. He knew he was the son of God, but what is Satan's if? Satan's if is always trying to make you doubt. So here we go. Ready? I'm going to put this up on the screen. The if of Satan questions the word of God. The if of man questions the will of God. And the if of God is conditioned upon your obedience of how you receive a miracle from God. I asked my dad about two, well, it was a couple years before he passed away. Dad had great success in praying for people with cancer. And I said, Dad, I want to ask you a question. In your lifetime, have you ever said, God, if it be your will, and that person get healed? And I thought, you know, he's going to answer me in a minute or two. He waited, he waited, he waited. We're driving the car. I said, Dad, did you hear me? He said, oh, yeah, I'm thinking, son. He went to every church he ever pastored, every meeting that he ever been in, every time he ever saw somebody healed, everything he could remember, he said, now, y'all that knew Dad, he was left-handed, right? And he would do the Lord brother thing. Lord, now, brother. And that's what he would do with that left hand. He said, Lord, now, brother, come to think of it. I can't recall any time that they ever put an if in front of a healing prayer and God did something because it's too passive a prayer. Because when you put an if in front of it, you're saying, I don't know if it's your will or it's, oh, this is good teaching. All right. Let me tell you a quick story in the next minute or so. I had a situation that I was really praying, I was seeking God for, and things really were looking well. Somebody I really cared about, I really loved. And then all of a sudden we had a setback. Now Robbie was with me. Uh, when the setback took place and I got a phone call and things were not looking good for this person and I, just, I got so upset I just started spouting off and I just start I'm just telling you what it uh, you know this and this and I ought to just give up and why don't we and I was just negative 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 all, it was just spewing out of my mouth because I had been holding on to God believing God to touch the situation and now it didn't look like nothing was nothing was happening 
and the Lord spoke to me and he stopped me cold. Robbie will remember this. He's behind the camera. God spoke to me and said, don't you abort your breakthrough. See, and it was two weeks later I heard this story. And the Lord told me, every time you pray, never use an if. So now we don't say, you know, if the Lord will say, when God does this. <laughs> See, we're building a building for young people. We don't say, if we can get it built, we say, when we get it built. We're going to win a lot of people to the Lord one day. It's not if we win them, it's when we win them. Come on, change the if to a win. Is anybody hearing me? Change the if to a win. Oh, my, 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 change your if to a win. Man, I feel some fire in this place. And so those of you that's watching me, please remember that. This simple little story, and I'm telling you, there are no ifs in God's plan. It is not if he returns, it's when he returns. It's not if he sets up his kingdom, it's when he sets up his kingdom. It's not if we're going to be caught up, it's when are we going to get caught up. It's not if we're going to heaven, it's when we go to heaven. It's not if we're going to walk on streets of gold, hallelujah, it's when we walk on streets of gold. Because there are no ifs in God's plan. Woo! For those of you watching me, we're here in Israel with our tour group, and I'm telling you, I feel such an unction of the Lord, and I want to encourage you to build your faith in God and take the if out. I wrote a book called Exposing Satan's Playbook, and I've got this story of the ifs in there, and I want you to hear all of it and glean from it, so the announcer's coming to tell you how you can receive it right now. Hallelujah, somebody. Glory to God. Woo! Barry Stone is now making available his newest book, This Season of Angels. In this study, Perry will answer the following questions. How can I discern if an angel is present? Why do angels appear in dreams and yet look like men and not angels with wings? Early Christians taught there is an angel of healing. What is his name? When a loved one dies, does a death angel enter their room and remove their spirit? How do angels help me battle demonic activity attacking my family? What is the biblical basis for asking angels to help reach my unsaved family members? These and many more questions are answered in Perry Stone's newest landmark book, This Season of Angels. Discover how global prophetic activity increases angelic activity in the last days through visions and dreams. Learn from Genesis 19 about how angels at times can appear in human form. Perry also answers 21 questions about angels, including biblical evidence that at times animals can see or sense an angel, and how parents can pray and ask God for angels to guard and protect children. This hardcover 207-page book contains 12 dynamic chapters that explore fascinating truths that will enlighten your understanding on the subject of angels. When you order this book, Perry is including a new two audio CD teaching set, Defeating Satan's Toughest Attacks. Perry will reveal how to deal with depression, oppression, and suicidal thoughts, and how to defeat the spirit of the double curse. Order the new book and audio CD set online at perrystone.org or call the toll-free number 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323 and ask for offer number ANG131. You may also send a donation of $30 or more and request offer ANG131. The address is Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. We look forward to hearing from you soon. I not only want to just mention the significance of the seasons of angels that we're in and you're about to enter in in your home and family. Uh, I have a chapter in there about how an angel can go out and find your mate, the person you're supposed to marry. So all you singles out there, you need to read that chapter first. But let me just say this to you real quick. The audio CD album on reversing that double curse is worth it. People were healed instantly at a big conference at the end of that message. And I believe God can heal some of you and deliver some of you from oppression and depression. So please get that. And remember, when you order it, you help keep manifest on the air. Thank you for your support and for your prayers. We can't do what we do without many, many wonderful friends and partners of our ministry. You know, I want to take a moment and just speak to those who live outside of the United States. The Manifest Telecast is on satellite. Of course, it's also on 
laptops where people are able to view it that way. But we are discovering that there are entire nations, and I'm not going to name them, but entire nations outside of the United States where so many people uh, consistently watch the manifest program that when we started getting the reports back, we were stunned and shocked by it. We're discovering that so many of these overseas are coming to the knowledge of the Lord and the knowledge of a redemptive covenant. And let me explain something to you briefly. A redemptive covenant is what Jesus Christ came for. Men or man and mankind in general, men and women, were separated from God because of the fall of Adam and Eve. And Jesus came as the sacrifice for sin and through his precious sinless blood, that blood washes us of our sins. And that's how we are cleansed and justified in the eyes of God is through the sacrifice that Jesus made at the cross. So I want to say to you that if you are, if you know you're unsaved, if you're a pagan, a heathen, a sinner, maybe you're, in, maybe you're with another religion that doesn't understand what, even what I'm saying. I, I do believe this. If you will ask the Father, the Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, to reveal Jesus Christ to you, you'll have a dream, you'll have a vision, or you will feel the presence of God coming over you. I have known of people that would just start praying out to God. They'd be in a field working or up on a mountain somewhere, and they would say, God, in the name of Jesus, show me if Jesus is real. And all of a sudden, the power of God would come upon them, and they would be overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord. So I want to encourage you to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to ask God in heaven to reveal him to you. And it doesn't matter where you live, he will do it without a preacher, without teaching, without anybody to even baptize you in water. No matter where you live, he can save you right where you are. And then he'll uh, send the people into your life that you need to help you grow in the Lord. And of course, thank God for social media and internet and all those and, and television stations, of course, that people can tap into. Uh, speaking of tapping into the presence of God, Friday, the 25th through the 27th of January, Jacksonville, Florida, Evangel Temple Assembly of God, a great weekend, Summit in Alabama on February 1, 2, and 3, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Summit in Alabama Church of God. We had one of the greatest meetings last year. Alabama people, all of you in that area, get to that meeting. I want to see you there. Peristone.org will have all of our itinerary for 2019. Please check it out. Uh, we do also, um, of course, Facebook Live and all the other social media that everybody else does. And you can, of course, keep up with us that way with our updates and things of that nature. The greatest thing I can say to all of you around the world, even in the United States, is it's not about church, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you have sinned or you know that you're away from God, you have no relationship, ask Him, Lord Jesus, save me. Come into my life, cleanse me by the powerful blood of Jesus Christ and make me your child. And God will adopt you into the family of God in heaven and earth. Amen. That's what the Bible talks about. Well, I'll be back next week with another Manifest Telecast. And please don't forget to get the book. Uh, it's also available in bookstores.